offering this morning, tithes and the offerings. Of course, you can tell Pastor Philip is not with us this morning. Uh, we'll be remembering him in prayer. Amen. I'm so thankful that there's nobody greater than Jesus we can call on. Amen. Yeah. There's nobody greater. I love that song. I was singing that thing this morning. I told Chris I had to call Brother Richard this morning and tell him I was running a little bit behind. But I was having church all by myself at the house this morning. And ain't nothing wrong with that. He said, well, Brian, i got to run by and pick up Bruce. I'll be there in a few minutes. I might be a little late, too. But I'm so thankful that we don't have to gather together just to have church. I can praise God all by myself. But I'm telling you, I love being together with other Christians. And I love being together with believers that believe like I do. And we love God like we do. And we worship and we praise. And Tracy, I thank you for singing those songs this morning. I talked with Pastor Philip maybe a year ago. And there were some things that I had to minister with some men. And I shared with him and I said, Pastor Philip, some of the men that I have to deal with and some of the people that I have to minister to, I said, man, their scars run so deep. They've been through some stuff. How many of you have some scars today? You've been through some stuff. I said, man, those scars run pretty deep. He said, hold on, tell me that again. I told him, I said, Philip, they, they have scars that just run so deep. He said, hold on a minute. He said, Brian, the Holy Ghost just told me to tell you that if their scars run deep, but His stripes run deeper. Amen. And he said, my God, I want to preach that one. He said, but God won't let me. He said, that one's yours. He said, so whenever God gives you the rest of that thing, you wear it out. That's what we're going to do this morning. I want to talk to us about the scars that run deep and the stripes that run even deeper. Amen? Amen. See, we live in a world where people are hurt every day. You can't go throughout this world without running into some kind of hurt. We have scars. We've gone through some stuff, man. I mean, just gone through some stuff that we never expected. It just showed up at our front door one day. Caught us completely by surprise. The hurt showed up and, and it left a scar. I remember as a little boy working with my dad on cars and things like that, and I would watch his hands, and you can't help but miss him. He's got hands big as ketchup mitts. But I would look at his hands and see some of the scars and the marks on them. And I would say, Daddy, how did that happen? He tell my son, and the wrench slipped, and I caught my knuckle on the exhaust manifold, or whatever it was he was doing. But every little star had a little story behind it. And that thing intrigued me as a little boy, just seeing and, and wondering what he had done and, and how those scars got there and what he was doing when all of that happened. And I got to thinking, Lord, we got a story to tell with the scars that are left on our, our life. And we're going to dig into just a little bit of that today. We get wounded, we get hurt. There's a lot of things that happen to us. Some of it we ask for, some of it we don't ask for, amen? But regardless, we still end up with some kind of a mark left on us because of things that we go through. Isaiah chapter 53, and most of that chapter deals with Jesus Christ and everything that He did, and, and it deals with the strikes that, and the healing that came from that and what He had to go through. Beginning in verse 1, It says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of the dry ground. My God, he grew up as a root out of the dry ground. That is nothing short of miraculous. Has anybody ever tried to plant something in the sand? That does not work out too well. You gotta cultivate that thing. You gotta have the right environment, Sister Tracy. You can't just plant anything anywhere. You ain't gonna plant something in the sand. I promise you, if I go plant collard greens in the sand, they ain't coming up like I want them to. You gotta turn that soil. There's a lot of things. I remember watching my grandpa as a little boy. He had to get the ground ready. He had to prepare everything before he could place the seeds into the ground. 
And I remember watching that and thinking that was so cool because my grandpa could grow anything. If we wanted watermelons, he would plant the watermelons and come, you know, the fall, he would plant pumpkins and, and he would have squash and watermelons and beans and you name it, strawberries. We go out and pick strawberries. But he had to prepare that land before he could just put something in it. God has to prepare us before he can just put something in there. Amen. But when it comes to Jesus Christ, he grew up as a root out of a dry ground. So he was planted, he grew out of a dry ground. That's the miraculous inception right there. God sent Jesus and he drew his, grew as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. The word goes on to say that he's despised and rejected of men. Man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. The word says surely in verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet did we esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 7 says that he was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Drop down to verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. The first time I read that thing, I had a problem with it. Lord, it pleased you to bruise him. I don't understand. You have to help me know what the Scripture is trying to tell me, Lord, because I just don't know. I'm not getting it, Lord. I don't understand. And the Holy Ghost began to reveal to me. It pleased the Lord to bruise Jesus because He knew that it was just about over with. The price was about to be paid and it started with the bruising, amen? And it ended with the nailing and the resurrection and all those things that went on. We'll be celebrating that in just a couple of weeks. But it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had to put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Verse 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he had poured out his soul unto death, he was numbered with the transgressors. He was numbered with me. He was numbered with you. He was numbered with the transgressors. Amen? And he bare the sins of many. He bore my sins. He bore your sin. He bore the sins of many. Nobody else could do it. God could have said, I looked high and low and I couldn't find anybody to do it. Jesus, there's nobody but you. And He made intercession for the transgressors. You see, we couldn't do it on our own. We needed a healing that only came from Jesus Christ. It can only come from the root that came from a dry ground. There's a lot of places I can go. I can go to the pharmacy. I can get some things to make me feel a little bit better. I can take the medicine to make my headache go away. But I'm telling you, there are some things that only God can heal in our lives today. There are some hurts that only Jesus Christ knows about. And the reason He knows about it is the Word says that, that He was made like unto a man. I believe that. And He was tempted in all manner like we are. Luke's translation, He knows what we're going through because He went through some of the same things. He knows us. He knows our infirmities. He knows when we're hurt and He knows why we hurt. Amen? And He knows, I know who He is. And I know that He is the healer. I know that He is the only one that can do that for me. My daddy can't do it. My mama can't do it. My grandma cannot heal me. Jesus Christ 
shed his blood at Calvary, and it began with the bruising. By his stripes, I am healed. Now, I love the way this thing is written in the Scripture. We're in the book of Isaiah here. Old Testament. Jesus hadn't come along yet. But look at the word calling those things as not. Look at the word prophesying into the future and making it. I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. Why? Because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This was prophesied in Isaiah. Come to pass in the New Testament. You see, the healing was there before the first strike was ever laid on his back. Before the first bruise was put on him. Before the first slap. Before the first accusation was made against Jesus Christ. The healing was already there. Amen. Amen. It says in Isaiah 53 and 5. We are healed. 1 Peter chapter 2. 21 through 24. Says that we by his stripes we were healed. So in Isaiah it says we are healed. Second Peter says we were healed. The healing was there before the need ever came up. Amen? Amen. Now we have issues that we deal with on an everyday basis. There are three kind of hurts that I want to talk about this morning that leave scars on us. The first type of wound that we get is a self-inflicted wound. We do the stupidest stuff sometimes. Amen. We make the worst mistakes. And we know better. How many of you remember your mom and dad telling you, boy, don't, don't do that. Young lady, don't do that. If you touch the stove, it's hot. If you touch it, it will burn you. And what do we do? Wait till mom and dad is not looking. We've already been told what's going to happen and we touch it. Look, I couldn't hide when I touched the stone. All the girly came out in me. That thing hurt. I wasn't screaming and hollering. She come around there and had blisters on my little fingers. What, did you touch that? No! That's self-inflicted wounds. There was a lady in the Bible. Her name was Gomer. She was a prostitute. She made a lot of bad decisions. She made some terrible decisions. A lot of self-inflicted wounds that she had to deal with. The word of the Lord came to Hosea. Told him, he said, I want to take, I want you to take for yourself a wife, the harlot. <laughs> Sometimes the stuff God tells us does not make any sense to us. Amen? Amen? But if God tells you, now you better know God told you, Amen. but if God tells you, you better listen and do exactly what He says. He tells Hosea, you're going to take a wife of the heart. Verse 3 of Hosea 1 says that Hosea took Gomer the daughter of Dibley. They were married. This preacher, this prophet, this man of God was married to a harlot. And I believe that things went good for a while. But then temptation came back in. How many of you know temptation will not leave you alone? It will keep knocking at the door. It will keep gnawing at you. It will keep putting itself right in front of you. But I remember a scripture that says with every temptation there has already been made a way of escape. Amen? Amen. So devil, you can throw all of them you want to at me. All I've got to do is look for the door in the way of escape. And then when I see it, it's my job to act on it. I have to walk through that door of escape. Amen? Amen. 
We get into trouble and we hurt ourselves when we don't follow through with the, the plan that God has laid out for us. And He's made a way of escape for us and we sit there and we decide that it's better for us to do what we know we're not supposed to do. So Hosea and Gomer were married. Everything was good until verse 5. Where it says that she keeps playing the harlot with other lovers. She kept chasing, she kept chasing, she kept chasing. You see, this is the story of a picture and type of Israel. That God is trying His best to love them. And pouring out blessings on them. Taking care of them. You're my chosen people. And the children of Israel keep running out. And they keep cheating on God. They keep having affairs with the world. They keep having affairs with the devil. They keep holding hands with the devil and trying to, to rub up against God. Snuggle up against God. You cannot sit close to God and hold the hand of the devil at the same time. You need to know that this morning. There's no way you can do that because darkness and light cannot inhabit the same room. Amen? And where God is, the devil cannot be. Amen? When the devil is in your life and you want him out, begin to, to say the name of Jesus. Because my Bible tells me that even the demons believe and they tremble. Amen. And the name of Jesus will make them run away from you. They will flee from you. Amen. Because of the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus this morning. There will be power in the name of Jesus when I wake up tomorrow morning. There was power in the name of Jesus yesterday morning. There will be power in the name of Jesus when my grandchildren, great-grandchildren, however long we're going to be here, as long as we're here, there is always power in the name of Jesus. And the devil can't do nothing about it. Amen. You see, he can come at you and say a lot of things. But one thing he will never say is, I can take Jesus. You see, he thought he had him in the graveyard. Something started happening. And three days later, he got up again. Amen. The Spirit of God raised him from the dead. So don't think that the devil has all this power. Now, he's got some. He's got limited power. And he can only do to you what God allows him to. But that's not my message for this morning. But hard up. Hosea is there and, and Gomer starts to go out. And she begins having these affairs. She begins chasing after these lovers because she's just not satisfied with what Hosea has to offer her. How many times do we do the same thing with God? We're just not satisfied with what He's given us. But Lord, I'm looking out and I'm seeing the ungodly blessed with more than I have. And God can say, but you have me and they won't. What else could you possibly need this morning? You've got me. What else do you need? Job put it real good. Naked came out in this world. Naked shall I leave. You ain't taking nothing with you today. You leave out. You ain't taking nothing with you. But this is the type of husband that Hosea was to go with. She's a prostitute and she's run out and she's began sleeping with these other lovers and giving herself away to these other men. Verse 7 and 8 of Hosea chapter 1 says that he sent her gifts of corn and wine and oil and silver and gold. And she thought it was from her lovers. She had no idea that Hosea had sent those gifts to her. I believe she didn't know they came from him because that she was not expecting gifts from the one she was hurting. Amen. Jesus was a gift to us from the one that we hurt. Preacher, how do you know that? The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Nothing in myself. It was all the love that He had for us that made Him lay down His life for us. Amen. He went willingly. Amen. It was all about the love that He had for us. No matter how many times we had played the part of the harlot with the world, or no matter how many times we had tried to run away from Him, He's always there. We 
gifts of salvation and healing and gifts of redemption and things like that. They're always there for us. All we have to do is repent and run back to Him. Amen? Amen. Chapter 3 of Hosea is a beautiful picture of what God did for us. You see, Gomer had, had sold herself into slavery, into the prostitution. She was on an auction block going to be sold. That's how far sin will take you, amen? amen. She was standing there beaten down, abused by all these men. Nothing left of her. And she's standing there probably in chains. I don't know. I wasn't there. Running through her mind, how did I mess this thing up so bad? How did I get here? What did I do? What made me go wrong? Where did I make the mistake in? How many times have we said the same thing? Oh, how did I get here? I was in church every Sunday. How did I end up here? Lord, I was taught in Sunday school. How did I end up on the side of the road drunk as the day is long? Lord, I was taught the lessons when I was a kid and I, I was faithful to church. How did I end up in the bars? How did I end up in drugs? I don't know. I don't. And God says that doesn't matter. How? You got there. The only thing that matters is you realize where you are now. And I'm right here waiting for you. I love you. I sent you those gifts while you were doing what you did. While you were starring yourself, I was sending the gifts to you. And she's standing there ashamed and looking down and these men are bending on her. She hears a voice in the back and she hears, sees the gavel go up and watches the gavel come down and it smacks down and the gavel price falls at 15 pieces of silver far below what she was really worth. How many times have we sold ourselves far below what God says about us? Mm -hmm. But my God, when she opened her eyes and she looked up at the man that bought her, it was the man that loved her, the man that went the extra way, the man that would do anything in the world to have her back, amen? The man that went about doing the Father's business because God told him to and he did. The same way Jesus Christ said, I want to buy you back, stars and all. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what people say about you. I love you. I don't care about your stars. I've got them too. And I'll show them to you one day. And I'll explain them to you. But right now, I just want to buy you back. It's called redemption. Jesus loves us stars and all. She was starved by so many self-inflicted wounds. Christ didn't mind because His stars, His stripes ran deeper. Amen? I want to look at some other types of scarring that we go through and that we end up with on this road of life. Because you know we do in life together. Amen? The second type of scar that I believe we run into is that unintentional scar. You know, you're around somebody and they, they think they're doing the right thing. And they want to help you, but they just kind of make matters worse. You know, they're not real sure, but they're, they're trying to do what they can. Now, all they want to do is help, and they end up scarring you. Anybody ever been there? Best intentions in the world, but you end up with a scar. You want Bible for that? I'm glad you do, because I got it for you this morning. The story of Mephibosheth, and Pastor Philip preached on this a few weeks back. Mephibosheth didn't do anything at all to deserve the scars that he had. Nothing. Nothing. But he ended up with some scars. He ended up with some issues that would follow him the rest of his life. And it was through no fault of his own. See, in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, we read where his scars came from. Second Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame on his feet. 
He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out in Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. She was doing a good thing. And it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. All she was doing was trying to help him. And she started. him. She didn't mean to. There's so many people along the way that mean to help us. They don't, they don't want to hurt us. They don't mean to scar us, but they do. And those are some things that we have to deal with. 2 Samuel chapter 9. And we'll look at the story of Mephibosheth. And just put yourself in his place for a moment or two. Beginning in chapter, one, chapter 9 verse 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left in the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? I'm so glad for the kindness of Jesus Christ. Amen. And there was at the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they called unto him, or called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. The king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan has yet a son which is laying on his feet. I am so thankful that that servant remembered that man that was laying on his feet. And you know what that tells me this morning? You may be laying on your feet, but you want somebody's mind today. You might be going through some stuff, but somebody is praying for you somewhere. This man was on this servant's mind. And he said, yes, sir, there is. There's a man who's laying on his feet. The king said unto him, where is he? Now he's on the king's mind. Ziba said unto the king, behold, he is in the house of Magrib, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. That word Lodabar, one of the names for it is the house of no bread. Jump to verse 7. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show you the, the kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul, thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. He went from the house of no bread to eating at the house and the table continually. They shall eat bread at my table Continually. He bowed himself and he said, What is that servant? You should look on me as a dead dog as I am. Jump down to verse 10. Towards the end of it, he said, But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Verse 11. As for Mephibosheth said the king, He shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. How many of you know that one day we're going to sit at the table as one of the king's sons? Oh, I'm not going to sit outside like a hired servant. I'm not going to have to stand on the back side of the property and say, I really would like to be a part of what's going on because of my relationship with him and because the blood was applied to my life and because I am a child of God, I serve him. Because I'm a child of God, I love him. But because I'm a child of God, there's some benefits that come along with that. And there's coming a marriage supper one day that I will be able to sit down at with Jesus Christ. I will be able to partake of that because I am a child of God. And because we have made it through, we're going to sit at this table continually. Amen? Boy, had some scars. Stuff he had to, to work with and, and, and work out and deal with. Verse 13 says, So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, and he did eat continually at the king's table and was laying on both of his feet. So he was hurt by somebody else. He didn't ask for it. He didn't do anything to deserve that. But he had to carry those scars. Amen. Had, couldn't get rid of them. Had to carry them. He had deep scars. You know, he couldn't do anything about the scars because if he could have, he already would have. Amen? Amen? If we could do something about the situation we're in, we already would have. At least I would. If I could do something about it, I would have already done it. But I can't do it in myself. That's right. You cannot do it in yourself. We need Jesus Christ. We need God to intervene on our behalf. 
We need the Holy Ghost to help us while we're here. Amen? Amen. He couldn't do anything about the scars. Oh, but the king could. Amen? He couldn't do anything about his situation. But when the king showed up, things changed in his life. When the king showed up, he didn't have to sit in his house anymore. When the king showed up, he wasn't just a lame man living in a house on somebody's mind. He was sitting at the king's table that day. And he didn't have to worry about anything anymore because the king had stepped in and taken care of the scars. And I believe that those scars are there. And they could have asked him what happened. And he could say, there was a day that a man came to my house. There was a day that the king called for me and he took me out of where I was and placed me where he wanted to be. Amen. Spiritual application. There was a day when the king came and knocked on my heart's door and he took me from where I was and he took me to where he wanted me to be. Amen. 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 See, I had some scars. Amen. But he didn't mind. Right. He didn't mind at all. Amen. When the king gets involved, stuff starts happening. Why? Because the king has power. Jesus Christ is the king. He has power this morning. He has authority this morning. He has the ability to get things done this morning. My God, nobody can do it like Jesus can. Nobody can. Nobody can touch me like Jesus can. Nobody can minister to me like Jesus can. Amen. Nobody can speak into my ear in the middle of the night when everything is falling apart like Jesus can. Nobody can meet me in the hospital room like Jesus can. Nobody can meet me in my bedroom like Jesus can when everything is falling apart and I prayed everything that I know to pray. Nobody can do that like Jesus can. When the king gets involved, my God, things begin to happen. When he gets involved, Stuff gets straightened up. You see, I don't need a 12-step program. I just need to follow the same steps of 12 men that followed him. He said, follow me. He didn't give me a 12-step deal. He said, you follow me. There's two things you need to, be, to need to do to be saved. And it ain't rocket science. You believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, thou shalt be saved. It's that simple. That's right. I don't need to celebrate recovery. I need to celebrate redemption this morning. I need to celebrate salvation this morning. I need to celebrate Jesus this morning. I need to celebrate God and the Holy Ghost this morning. I need to celebrate the blood because if it wasn't for blood, and the blood came before the scars did. The blood came before the scars did. I don't need the latest or the greatest self-help book. All I need is this book. Because everything I'll ever go through, the answers are in here. Romans chapter 4 verse 3. What saith the scriptures? You need to learn that. When people come to you and say, Hey, how in the world do you do? What do you think about this? And why you take them to Romans chapter 4 verse 3. And you ask the question, What saith the scriptures? What does that mean? What's the Bible say about it? Because I won't give you $5 for my opinion. And if I won't give you $5, you won't give me $0.05 for my opinion. But I'm going to tell you right now, my thoughts and my opinions are based on the Word of God. Amen. That's why what stated in the Scriptures. That's what I want to know. Don't tell me your opinion and what you think about it. Because that's what gets people in trouble. Well, I think I can do whatever I want to do and I'm still going to make it. I think I can live like this because somebody else told me I could. I think it's okay for me to marry somebody just like I am. I think it's okay for me to do all these things I know that I'm not supposed to be doing and I'm still going to make it anyway. Don't God who loves me. He does love you. Don't get that thing mixed up. He loves you this morning. He loved us enough to send His Son to die for us. He doesn't need to do anything else. The work was finished. Yeah. That was scars. Until the king showed up. Third kind of scars we deal with are the scars that other people inflict on us. And sometimes those are the hardest ones to deal with. Amen. 
There was a man named Joseph in the scriptures, and everybody ought to know him. Everybody teaches about Joseph. His daddy loved him, he had a coat of many colors. Everybody knows about Joseph. But Joseph was star. And get this, do you know how he came about receiving those stars? Get this, he was doing what the father told him to do. The father said, go check on your brothers. Bring me a report back. Go tell me how things are going with your brothers. Let me know. Go out and be a good boy. Go, go. He was doing exactly what the father asked him to do. And he got hurt. Have you ever been hurt doing what God told you to do? See, folks don't recognize the anointing sometimes that God has placed on your life. You're in the workplace and you share in the gospel because God told you to. And somebody else that the word wasn't even for. Here's you talking about it. And then they're going to start running you down because you're one of them holy rollers. You ain't got no business talking about the stuff in the workplace. I don't have to go to upper management on you if you don't shut up about Jesus. They want to start hurting you. And all you're doing is the Father's business. See, Joseph was loved by the Father. He was doing exactly what his daddy told him to do. Just because you're being about the Father's business don't mean that your brothers won't turn on you. You hear me this morning. But when they do, we need to do the same thing Joseph did. We need to forgive him. Why? Because the stripes on Jesus' back run so much farther than the stars anybody can ever put on us this morning. See, sometimes the favor and the calling that the Father has placed on us will intimidate others. See, there's some folks that won't speak to a lady in a gas station. Because I'm not, I'm not supposed to do that. Lady this morning, she went in, and I'll tell you, I was at the church all by myself. I wrote in, she said, you in a good mood this morning. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to church. i got to preach this morning. She said, will you keep me in prayer this morning? I said, I promise you, I'll pray for you. And I went to get, I paid for the gas, went back out, pumped the gas. God said, you need to go tell her. I said, all right, Lord. So I went back in and I shared a little bit with her about what I was going to be speaking on this morning. Big smile come up on this lady's face. She said, my name is Michelle. Will you please remember me in prayer today? I said, yes, ma'am, I should. She's just being about the Father's business. There's nothing glorifying about Walking up and saying, hey, I'll be preaching this morning. This is my turn to be right here, that's all. But it happened on this day and I was able to speak to her this morning and speak into her life and encourage her along the way. That's what we're supposed to do. Amen. And I told her about the stars and the tears began to well up in her eyes. She said, where is your church at? I said, my pastor's not there this morning. I'm filling in for him. But if you go down Highway 25, about two and a half miles past I-20, look to the left, you'll see she said, I'm going to have to cry, so I should we would love to have you. Love to have you live. See, I don't see in the scriptures where Joseph talked about all the wrongs that people had done to him. His own family. The brothers, when they saw him, one of the things they said, they hated him so much. They said, here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him. They took him and Reuben said, we can't kill him. Thank God for men like Reuben. I need some Reubens in my family. I need some Reubens in my church. Because there might come a day I say something or do something not meaning to you. And you say, we're going to kill him. We're going to kill him dead. <laughs> Lord, send a Reuben if that ever happens. <laughs> but he didn't talk about all the things that his brothers had done to him. He could have said, listen, y'all messed me up. Y'all hurt me more than I've ever been hurt. You took me and you threw me in a pit. And you took me out of that pit and you sold me into slavery. We're supposed to be brothers, man. But you sold me into slavery. Wow. I didn't see my daddy for a long time. I didn't see any of y'all for a long time. And then from there I got sold into Potiphar's house. Got lied on. And then I got thrown into prison. And I got dealt harshly with. But I was moved up again to second in command because God was with me. And I sat there for two years after I'd given the interpretation to a butler and a baker. 
And finally the king sent for me. Thank God the king sent for us. Amen? Amen. Sent for Mephibosheth and he sent for Joseph. Amen? And Joseph was released from prison that day. But he never talked about how wrong it was. He had scars laid on him. He was hurt by people that loved him. And those scars ran pretty deep, I'm sure. I don't know about y'all, but church hurt works, work hurts worse than just about any hurt I've ever gone through. Amen? Anybody ever had church hurt? Amen. Yeah, I was hoping I wasn't the only one. That's some hurting stuff. But you know what the church's job is? The job is to give one another. Help one another. You hurt me. Oh, good. You shared in Wednesday night Bible study. Grow up, thick enough. You'll be alright. You get hurt, it's okay. It's okay to have a scar. But it's not okay to hang on to that thing and hate somebody for it. You can't do that. Instead of telling about how wrong he was, we ought to start telling people about how much Jesus has made right in our life. You got a scar of alcoholism. But you also have a testimony of the day that God brought you out of that lifestyle. You see, there may be a scar of drug addiction on your life. And it, people that knew us knew. People that knew us before we got saved. I tell some of my friends from high school, I'm a preacher there. How in the world did that happen? My vice principal said the same thing when I took him back and introduced my children to him. He said, excuse me. He said, hey, Brian. I said, yes, sir. Mr. Harris, it's good to see you. I said, let me introduce myself to Reverend Brian Cowell. He about dropped the popcorn and drinks he had in his hand. He said, what? I said, yes, sir. You see, everybody's got scars. Everybody's got marks. But everybody's got a story behind that scar. The remedy for the healing is the word. And the wound, the healing for the, the remedy for the healing and the wounds is Jesus. Nothing else can heal it. Isaiah 53 says, With the stripes we are healed. No other way to be healed. You can't take enough Tylenol to get healed. You can't drink enough alcohol to get, keep, to get healed. You can't do enough whatever it is you're doing to get healed. You can only be healed by the blood. The body was broken for our healing. Luke chapter 4, 18-21. Jesus Christ was reading aloud the prophecy that was given over him again in Isaiah. Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, He has sent me, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he finishes that portion of Scripture by saying, This day is a Scripture fulfilled in your ears. Church, I want to tell you today that there is no wound that his strike can't heal. There's no scar it can't heal. You see, the scars only come after the healing. You see, the wound comes first, and then the healing, and the scars are left afterwards. Healing has to come before the scars do. You see, we get scars from going through stuff. There's no hurt that he can't heal this morning. There's no friendship that he cannot put back together. There's no scar of drug addiction that he cannot set free. There's not a broken marriage that he cannot restore. There's not a prostitute that he can't reach. And there's not a homosexual that he can't deliver this morning. There's not a sinner that he can't save. There's not a lying tongue that he can't turn in to a prophesying tongue. Amen. There's not a gossiping tongue that he can't turn into a praising tongue. There's not a broken heart that he cannot mend. Amen. If he can mend one, he can mend them all. Amen. There's no depression that he cannot lift off of you. Amen. There's no darkness that he cannot enlighten in you. There's no sickness he cannot heal. And there's no unforgiveness that he cannot help you forgive. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you right now, this is what I shared with that young lady this morning. I went back in and I said, God told me that I have to come in and share this with you. And that got her attention. We stand in the store slap full of people. Little guy behind the other counter looked at me. Didn't pay attention. I went straight to that lady. I said, God told me to tell you this. She got real quiet. She looked at me and I looked straight at her eyes. And I said, I want you to hear me good on this. 
God is telling me to tell you today that your scars do not define you. Amen. They're only there to remind you that God has refined you. You see, they don't define who we are. They don't. They only remind us of what God has done to refine us. Amen. And see, somebody said, don't judge my praise until you know the pain. That's right. So you can't judge somebody shouting and running all over the stage and dancing over here in the corner and running over here and kicking off your shoes in the choir and taking off around the church. You can't judge somebody. You can't judge their praise because you don't know the pain that they went through. Amen. Amen. You can't judge somebody that runs up to the altar with tears running down their face and they begin to praise and lift their hands to God. You can't judge that praise because you don't know the pain behind it. Amen. Praise is a powerful thing. I love to praise. Sometimes that devil will come at me. He'll come straight in my face sometimes. Start telling me things. You'll never make it. You will never make it. And then old praise songs begin to rise up. Praise. Yeah. Hallelujah. They begin to well up. Oh yeah. I ain't a singer, but he sure likes my praise. You know what I mean? That's right, man. Yeah. That praise will get his attention. When the devil comes up and says, Boy, you will not make it, because I know what you did. All them songs will come up. I will. Pastor Phil talks about being in the wood. I don't have any wood where I live in. When I got a harvest and we got some long winding roads, I'll jump on that jump and fire it up. It's one down and four up. I'll wear them gears out. We'll be out on the road just me and the Harley and Jesus. I'll be singing praises. I get back to the house. I feel so much better than I did. Amen. So much better. Amen. Because I begin to praise Him. I open my mouth. When the devil was trying his best to put that stuff in my mind, I began to open my mouth and I began to sing songs. Just riding down the road, in the house. Man, I had a good time this morning in the house. I promise you that. We got to sing. I got to enjoy it. God got to enjoy it. I got to feel good about it. I was about late getting here this morning. But the devil will come up and he'll tell you things. I see that star. Because I was there. I was the one that put it on you. I can tell you right where that star is. That's what I can do. You don't have what you think you have. Boy, them songs will come up quick. Some of them are old. Some of them are new. Some of them in between. But I'm telling you, there's something about praising. Amen. You can praise right through that thing. Them songs like New Name will come up and I get to singing that joke to my throat hurts. I love them. I love them old songs. I like the old rugged cross. I like the ones we used to sing in the Baptist church. I like the ones we hear now on 88.3. I like it all. I like everything in between. If it talks about God, I like it. You hear me? But you can't judge their praise because you don't know their pain. And I can't remember if it was Lynn or Candy posted something on Facebook this week. And that joke I had me shouting all over the house. So when I saw that thing, it was good. It said, you can't judge my breakthrough until you know my been through. Yeah. Don't judge the breakthrough because you don't know the been through. You don't know what she's been through. You don't know what I've been through. And I don't know what you've been through. But there comes a time when we've been through stuff that the breakthrough comes. And when the breakthrough comes, the praises begin to come out. Amen. I'm telling you, I love Eddie James, and we'll be singing that joke. I text the words of Chris this morning. Devil talking about you ain't got no right to preach. Yeah, you should have been there when I came through. That's where you should have been, devil. That's where you should have been. Because the church was on fire and the Holy Ghost too. <laughs> the top of my head and the sole of my feet. I felt the spirit moving all over me. You know why, devil? Because I got the rhythm. I'll be singing them things like wide open, as hard as I can. Praying, dancing, shouting. Neighbors think I done lost my mind. Amen. But that's all right. God says, I hear you, boy. Keep saying it. Right. Yeah, he says, no, you ain't. You ain't going to make it. Oh, yes, I will. I know you know where the stars are, but I know where the stripes are, devil. You hear me and hear me good. 
There is nothing I have done that has not been forgiven. And you can run your mouth all day long. You can talk about the scars that I have on my body. You can talk about that. You can talk about the things that I've been through. But when it comes to the blood, there is nothing you can do about it. Because the stripes were laid on a man named Jesus. They were put on his back and they were put there for me. And I take advantage of those stripes. Because Jesus Christ died for me and I'm not going to let that go by. I'm going to grab everything I can while I can. Amen. And I'm telling you, the scars might run deep, but his stripes run deeper. Amen. You see, we ain't the only ones with scars. Jesus Christ has the scars on his back. He's got them. They're still there. So it's an all preacher. I don't believe that. Well, read the book of what saith the scriptures. In the book of Revelation, John was crying. One of the elders said, John, why are you crying? Why are you so sad? He said, because there's nobody worthy to open the book. He said, look, John said, I beheld a lamb as though it had been slain. The stars are still there. And just a couple more verses down, he looks again and he says, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. You see, he's the lamb that was slain. He still has the stars. He's been battle tested, battle proven. Oh, he never lost one. His stars run deeper. My stars run deeper. His stripes run deeper than anything I've ever had to run into. Anything I've ever... You see, the... To the one here this morning that has self-inflicted wounds that you've been dealing with, know this. God is right here. And the same blood that flowed at Calvary is the same blood that still flows today. I love you know, I'm, a, I'm a song person. I'm a worshiper. Blood that never loses power. I love Andre Crouch. Reaches the highest mountain down in the lowest valley. Yeah. It ain't lost on his power. To those of you here that may be dealing with a hurt that was unintentional, that blood is still here. For those of you that may have been hurt by others, it's still here this morning. The stripes run deeper than any scar that's ever been placed on your life. You need to know that this morning. I don't know about y'all, but every chance I get, I'm going to praise God. Every chance I get when the devil comes to me and says, Hey, I know what you did. Hey, yeah, you're right. You were there. I was there too, dummy. You think I don't know it? Got to learn how to talk to him. I was there. And I know you were too, but look at him. You have to take that up with Jesus. Because when I took it to him, he took it away. And according to the Bible, he cast that thing as far as the east is from the west. So good luck finding it, big boy. And if you want to bring that thing up, you've got to go past the blood. And you can't go past the blood. Why? Because those stripes run deep. You hear me this morning? I'm going to ask Tracy if she come back and play. I'm telling you right now, I don't care what you've gone through, what you've been through, what you will go through. There is no scar that is left on your life that the stripes cannot hear me this morning there's nothing no hurt there's no divorce there's no hurt there's no church hurt there's no family hurt there's no death there's no losing a child losing a loved one there's no scar so big that God cannot heal that thing this morning, if you're dealing with some of that stuff, I want to encourage you this morning. I want you to know that those stars are still, still visible. You still see them. I got plenty of math about it sometimes. I'll tell you what God did for me. I'll tell you what He brought me out of. Because I can't brag on me, but I can brag on what He did for me. Because His stripes ran so deep. And the blood ran so strong. I don't worry about the scars no more. I don't worry about 
I know they're there. You know your stars are there. One of the biggest stars you'll ever have to deal with, the devil will come up and say, hey, I'm going to show you this one from your past. And I have to remind him, yep, but this is my present. You're talking about two different time frames, devil. You're talking about when I belong to you. But I'm talking about that day that the line was drawn in the sand and I gave my life to Christ. That's gone. Now I may have messed up a time or two. But when I repented and went to Jesus Christ, He was faithful, He was just, and He forgave me. He's not going to keep accusing me like you are. That's your job. My job is to rebuke you in the name of Jesus and go say, hey, Jesus, look at here, I can't do this. I need you to help me, Jesus. And you know what Jesus said? I got you. I got you. And He says one word to him, go. And you know what the devil has to do? Oh, he's got to go. I'm telling you this morning, there is nothing in your past that's worth keeping you there. You hear me? No mistake bad enough that you can't come to this altar and make that thing right. There's no scar so big that God will say, no, that one, I can't do nothing with that. See, that scar goes across your face and everybody's going to see it. I only want to deal with the scars that nobody sees. No. God said, I'll take that scar that covers your whole body. That one that draws attention to everything you did before. He said, I'll make that thing a testimony for you. And I'll let you tell people about my goodness. So if you're dealing with anything this morning, anything from your past, you haven't probably given up. The devil's been beating on you this week. He's always open. I promise you that. God is here. Holy Ghost has been there all day. I woke up with the Holy Ghost this morning. Feeling good. Didn't sleep good, but I woke up feeling good. You hear me? Because I knew what was going to happen when I got to church. I knew there was going to be some powerful praying. Some powerful praise and worship. And I was going to get the opportunity to share with somebody what God had given me for this morning. So I'm going to encourage you. These altars are open. If you want to pray, you need prayer. You make your way down to these altars. We'll pray with you. We'll pray that thing through. But I want you to know today that there is nothing too hard for God. There is nothing too hard for a man named Jesus. There's no scar, no sin, no mistake that He can't help you with. We're going to pray today. Lord, I thank You right now. God, I thank You that the scars that we have do not define us, Lord. They're there only to remind us that you have refined us. God, I thank you for everything that you've walked me through today. God, I thank you that, that I've got a breakthrough, God, because of something that I've been through. God, I thank you that i got to praise now instead of pain, Lord. God, I thank you that I can stand and praise in the face of the devil when he comes accusing me like he does. God, I thank you that you are always, always, always there. And Lord, I thank you that the stripes that were placed on your back, oh Lord, they run so deep. And the blood is running, and the blood is flowing, and it's still flowing today. And it's still just as powerful today as it was the first strike they laid on your back. And Lord, I'm thankful that you have the scars. I'm thankful that you were willing to go through what you went through for somebody like me. Because like the prostitute was running off to other things, God. That's what I was doing for a long time. Just running away from you and running to things in the world, God. When I know that you wanted a relationship with me that was based strictly on you and not everything else going on. Lord, I bless you today. God, I thank you. Lord, I thank you that those scars we have God, when people come up and say, you don't understand what I'm going through. I might have a scar that lines up with a scar on their body. And I can say, yes, I do, because I fell in the same place you did. But let me tell you what God did for me. You don't know what it's like to lose a child. Yes, I do. Let's sit down and talk about it.
You don't know what it's like to be delivered and be bound by alcohol and then wait on deliverance. And... Yes, I do. I've got the scars. But let me tell you about the blood that was applied. Jesus, I thank you for that blood that washes away every sin, every stain. God, I bless you today and I thank you, Lord. God, help us to always remember that your stripes were put on your back. For our healing, God, and salvation came from the blood, Lord. The word says it. Stripes were laid on your back. For our healing, your body was broken. For our healing, and your blood was shed for remission of all sin. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing right here to speak, Lord. Lord, we'll be careful to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Don't forget tonight, 5 o'clock, ladies, be back here. I love y'all. Thank you so much. Keep our pastors in prayer.